class and welcome to lecture 9 of our course. In this lecture we'll be discussing states of matter. We'll define solid, liquid, and gas. Uh, also look at the physical property of density and viscosity, pressure. Then we'll introduce a, uh, a new force, a buoyant force. And then we'll discuss Archimedes and Bernoulli's principle. So we'll get started by uh, discussing the three states of matter, which I'm sure most of you are already familiar with what a solid, liquid, and gas are. Um, a, a solid is a substance where the atoms and the molecules um, uh, are bonded together very strongly and held in place. And as a result, a solid holds a shape. Now, I, I mentioned atoms and molecules. I just want to briefly mention that an atom is the smallest constituent of, of matter of a particular element. Uh, there are many naturally occurring elements in the universe, such as hydrogen, helium, uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. And whenever two or more atoms bond together, that's what we call a molecule. And so, Solids could be a single element, like a solid piece of, say, copper or iron, or they could be, solids could be composed of molecules, like, say, for example, iron oxide, iron bonded with oxygen, and those molecules are bonded together to form a solid. So, solids, uh, the most important aspect of a solid is those strong inter atomic or molecular bonds that hold them in place. So they're fixed in place relative to each other. And that gives the solid its properties of, of being uh, relatively, I shouldn't say necessarily rigid, but able to hold a shape. Now, uh, solids could be either crystalline or non-crystalline. A crystalline solid is a solid in which the atoms and molecules that <coughs> compose it are systematically or non-randomly arranged uh, and that gives rise to several different physical properties of, of, uh, of a solid and uh, a solid can also be non-crystalline and uh, objects or solids that are non-crystalline um, include examples like glass so glass is not a crystal right where ice is a crystal. Um, so in glass, the atoms that compose the solid are randomly bonded together. They have no systematic arrangement. However, in, in ice, the water molecules that make up ice are, are non-randomly or systematically arranged on making it a crystal. So solids hold their shape, and we have crystalline and non-crystalline solids. So liquids is a state of matter in which those, if you take a solid and if you add enough energy to it, what happens is the atoms and molecules that make up the solid, they are moving in the solid, but they're still bonded together. If you give them enough energy, kinetic energy, they start moving more and more rapidly and they have enough energy that those bonds holding them together in place break. And that allows the atoms or molecules, depending on the, on the substance, um, to move freely or relatively independent of each other. I shouldn't say completely independent of each other, but they can slide past one another. And that process of those bonds that are holding the atoms or molecules together of a solid breaking and the atoms or molecules able to move freely past each other, we call that melting. All right, so if we add enough energy, uh, as we'll talk in our next lecture, that this energy is in the form of thermal energy. Uh, we increase the kinetic energy of those atoms and molecules to the point where those bonds break and they begin to move free, uh, independent, uh, can use that word? Uh, they can slide past one another. But it's important to note that there still are attractive forces between the atoms and molecules of a liquid. That's why. Um, that's one of the reasons why a liquid stays, the atoms and molecules stay together. 
Now, unlike a solid, a liquid takes the shape of its container. So whatever the shape of the container, a liquid will, under the force of gravity, be pulled down and take the shape of the container. In some liquids where uh, they, they have what's called surface tension, and surface tension is a result of those interatomic or intermolecular forces that I mentioned. There are forces there, uh, but so let's say if you have a liquid in a container, an atom or molecule here is attracted to atoms or molecules in all directions surrounding it. So it has forces pulling it in all directions. However, an atom or molecule at the surface of the liquid, it only has atoms and molecules beneath it, and so it's only being pulled down. So that pulls the atoms or molecules along the surface of the liquid down, which uh, creates surface tension. And surface tension is what causes little beads of uh, little bits of water to bead. All right, why doesn't water flatten out? A little bead of water flatten out? Well, because of surface tension. So the water molecules are attracted to each other. And on a small scale, that attractive force between the water molecules is stronger than the force of gravity that's pulling them down. And so that causes them to bead up. Uh, and also, you could fill up a container with, say, water to the brim, then add a little bit more water and you create this little dome of water that actually goes above the rim. How is that possible without the water spilling over? Well, it's that surface tension, right? These water molecules here are being pulled by the water molecules down there. And that pull on a small scale is stronger than the force of gravity that's pulling them, that would, that's pulling them out of from above the container and wants to pull them down to the, down to the, the uh, floor. So liquids can have what's called surface tension. Now if you add even more energy uh, to a liquid, so we start with solid, you add energy to it, it melts, it forms a liquid. If you add energy to a liquid, what happens is the atoms or molecules gain enough energy that they can overcome those those attractive forces in between the atoms and molecules, and they can become, now these can become independent of each other. I kept on using the word independent for liquid, but it's not the case. They can escape and fly off. So individual atoms or molecules begin to escape and fly off, and they become what's called a gas. So a gas, uh, a substance in gaseous state, is whenever the atoms or molecules are independent of each other and they move and they collide with each other and they collide with the walls of the container. And so a liquid takes the shape of the container but it's pulled down to the bottom by the force of gravity while a gas fills the entire space of a container. And the, and the gas molecules, they travel uh, in a straight line to constant velocity until they bounce off each other or bounce off of the walls of the container. They're just constantly moving. Uh, and if you add more energy to the gas, they just move faster. Because liquids and gases can both flow, they're known as fluids. They're both known as fluids. Um, and so liquids and gases, they both take the shape of their containers and they both flow which uh, ca uh, categorizes them as, as fluids. So that's what a solid, a liquid, and a gas are. Uh, a substance on Earth that's extremely important, water, is very, it's very interesting to think about how at the surface of the Earth, we find water in all three states of matter, solid, ice, liquid, it's liquid water, and gas as, as, as steam or water vapor. And uh, at atmospheric pressure, which is the pressure that the surface of the earth experiences due to the weight of the gas that's in the atmosphere, which we'll talk about pressure in a little bit, um, the water melts, ice melts at zero degrees centigrade, and it vaporizes at 100 degrees centigrade. So there's just a small range in uh, temperature in which water is liquid. Um, 
on the surface of the Earth. And if you think about, well, the conditions for those temp that temperature range to exist has to do with the proximity of the Earth to the Sun, has to do with the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, has to do with a lot of parameters. But the, the fascinating thing is all those parameters are just so that we have temperature on Earth's surface um, that given the pressure fluctuate around the temperature which we find water in a liquid state. If water, if, if Earth was maybe a little closer to the, uh, to the sun, we wouldn't find as much liquid water or any ice on the planet potentially. It would, it would, um, or if it was further, we would find uh, much less liquid water and more ice. Uh, and so the conditions being just so that we have liquid water has allowed life as we know it to evolve on this planet um, because water is critical to life as we know it. So um, it's, uh, it's just interesting to keep that in mind in the case of water. So that brings us to density. Now, uh, we mentioned that mass is a measure of the amount of matter in a substance. And we measure that in kilograms or grams, right? So we have uh, an object and it has a certain mass, right? So like uh, this, this stapler, we put it on a scale and that scale tells us how many grams or kilograms of, of, of matter are contained in this stapler. But we could imagine that an object could have the same amount of matter but take up more space. Or an object could have the same amount of matter and take up less space. And those three objects, say, let's say a one kilogram, say we have one kilogram of mass. If, if an object has one kilogram takes up, it's this size, an object that's one kilogram is this size, and an object that's one kilogram is this size, you know, they would all have the same weight, right? They'd all have the same weight because they have the same mass, one kilogram. But they have this different property about them, this different physical property. And that property is how much matter per unit volume is in them material. And that's the density of the substance. So density is uh, the amount of matter per unit volume. Okay, and so a volume so we know well, amount of matter, that's measured as mass. So that's say kilograms, right? So if we have a we have a density um, in the book, just to uh, use capital D. So density is equal to the amount of matter, which is we'll say mass over volume. Okay? So we can write that as M over V. So capital V, that represents volume, or I want to say that's a script V that represents velocity. A lowercase script V is velocity. Capital V um, is volume. So mass is measured in kilograms. What about volume? Well, to calculate the volume of a substance, we need its length, its width, and its height. So that's distance, right? Distance times distance times distance. So the standard unit of volume is length times length times length, or distance times distance times distance. So that's going to be meters cubed. So the standard units of um, of density are kilograms per meter cubed. 
Uh, in CGS units or centimeters, grams, seconds, uh, it would be grams per cubic centimeters. And uh, for example, uh, what, to give you an idea of a density of a very commonly known substance, the density of water, H2O, is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. So that is the density of water. What does that mean? If you had one cubic meter of water, so one meter this way, Right, this is a meter stick. If you had a container that's one meter this way, by one meter this way, by one meter in, that cube of water would have a mass of 1,000 kilograms. Right? If we took a, a tenth of that cube, it would have a mass of a tenth of this. It would be 100 kilograms. And so, so that's the density of water. And so the more mass per unit volume, the denser the substance. In general, uh, not always, but in general, a rule of thumb for a material is the most solid as a, uh, most dense as a solid, then less dense as a liquid, and then least dense as a gas. That's not the case for water. Uh, water is a little bit less dense as a solid than it is a liquid, which has some pretty significant implications. That is, that ice floats. Um, if ice didn't float, then what would happen, say, in the, in the polar parts of the ocean, and sea ice would form and then it would sink to the bottom of the ocean. On ponds, ice would form at the surface and then it would sink to the bottom. And as a result, ponds would freeze from the bottom up and not the top down, and they would freeze solid in the winter. But because ice floats, a layer of ice forms at the surface, it grows thicker. Uh, as the, the temperatures remain low for long enough, but it actually begins to act as an insulator and prevents the water from beneath it freezing. So uh, the fact that ice floats results in uh, bodies of water not freezing salt in very cold locations uh, and during winter months. So uh, water is a very unique substance, and the reason why water is less dense as a solid than a liquid is because of its crystal, uh, crystalline structure. The water molecules in an ice crystal arrange themselves in a way that they take up less space. The same number of water molecules, sorry, take up more space in the crystal structure uh, than, they, than, the, they, than they would as a liquid. So they're more compact um, as a liquid the water molecules, they kind of spread out and take up more space and they bond together to form a crystal. And so it's the same amount of mass, but in a larger volume as a crystal, that means it's less dense. And so uh, for water, it is less dense as a solid than a liquid. And now if we have a liquid, sometimes it's hard to measure the mass of a liquid, right? Maybe put a liquid on a scale. Uh, it's hard. So if we know the density of a liquid, we can calculate its, ga uh, its mass if we can measure its volume, which is much easier to measure. Because we know density equals mass over volume. If we know the density, we can calculate the mass right, by taking density times volume. Or if we know the mass, we can know how much of a liquid we have. If we know the mass, we can calculate the volume, right? Volume is equal to mass divided by density. So if we have two of the three, we can calculate the third. Um, and that's for any substance, not just liquids, for, for solids, liquids, and gases. Uh, if we have two of the three, density, mass, or volume, we can calculate the third. Right? So for example, if we had a volume of 2.3, let's, let's make it a little bit easier, say uh, 1.5 cubic meters of water, we know the density of water is 1,000 kilograms per 
cubic meter, what is the mass of that, of, of that volume of water? Well, the density is mass times volume, solving for mass, density times volume, g equals 1.5 meters cubed with the volume times 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. We have 1,500 kilograms. That's the mass of 1.5 cubic meters of water, right? 1,500 kilograms. Okay. That is density. So now moving on to viscosity, you might have heard of this term before, viscosity. Uh, it's a term that applies to liquids. And um, viscosity is the internal resistance to flow of a liquid. So if a liquid is very viscous, it doesn't want to flow. There's a lot of resistance. What would cause that resistance? Well, it's those intermolecular or interatomic molecules of the liquid, right? The more those, even though they can slide past each other, they're not bonded strongly together, locked into place as a solid. Even though they're a liquid and can move past each other, the forces between them are still strong. Uh, and that prevents them from wanting to spread out or, or move relative to each other. And that creates viscosity. If those forces are weak, then the fluid has a very low viscosity. The, the, the atoms can move very easily. They can spread out very easily. Where if you would pour something that's viscous, it would you know, it'd pour very slowly. And then it would kind of pile up and then slowly spread out because it's viscous. Where if you would pour a fluid that has a low viscosity, it would pour very easily, hit the surface, and spread out very quickly because it has a low viscosity. Right? So uh, quantitatively, sorry, qualitatively, you could think of it honey. Right? Honey is thick. It doesn't want to flow very easily because it's fairly viscous. Whereas water, it sloshes back and forth, it flows very easily. Water has a relatively low viscosity. Um, an example of honey or molasses or syrup, uh, they're viscous because of the nature of the molecules that make them up. They're complex organic molecules or, or sugars. They're long chains of carbohydrates. And they're long molecules that can get twisted up and tangled with each other. They're not strongly bonded together as a solid. They can move past each other, but they still get twisted and tangled. And that creates the viscosity. Where molar molecules, though they're attracted to each other, right, they are more simple in shape, and so they don't get twisted or tangled up as much, and that force pull, uh, pulling them together is not strong. Right, so that's viscosity. Um, now, flu uh, uh, liquids, they tend to become more viscous, more viscous uh, as you lower their temperature, and less viscous as you increase the temperature. That is viscosity. And that is a property mainly of liquids. So next, this brings us to pressure. Right? So, pressure is also probably something that you've heard of before. And uh, pressure is uh, produced by a fluid, so it's a liquid or a gas, that's under the influence of gravity. So for example, at the Earth's surface, fluids are, um, or on Earth, fluids are under the influence of Earth's gravitational force, and so fluids exert pressure on any object that's submerged or in the fluid. So let's think of, let's, let's see 
what pressure is. Okay, let's say we have a liquid. Let's say uh, it's, it's water, right? And let's say here is the surface of the water, and here's the, and um, we're at a certain depth. Now we, let's make an imaginary surface at that depth. Let's say this depth is a depth h beneath the surface. Now, if you were located at that depth on the surface, you would feel the weight of the water above you acting down. So, what, what, how much would that force be, the weight of the water? Well, we have this volume of water that's above you. surface for a second. Okay, let's say this is the surface. Uh, right here it's three-dimensional. And uh, at this point you have the weight of this water acting down on this surface. So what force is acting down on this surface? Right? What force F is acting down the surface? Now let's say also this surface has an area of A. Right? So does this. It has an area of A. It's the same surface. Right? Well, we'll find the force that's acting down on this surface that has area A. We have to find the weight of the water that's above it. Well, we know that weight is equal to mass times acceleration due to gravity. And so what is the mass of this, of this water? Well, the mass is equal to the density of water times the volume, right? Remember, density is mass over volume, so mass is equal to density times volume. So we're going to multiply that by g to get the weight. So now if we know the density of the fluid, so this is water, we know, so we know the density of water, we just need to know the volume. Well, the volume of this rectangular prism is going to be this area times this height. Okay? So we have the density times that area times the height, which is you can think of as the depth beneath the surface, times g. So that's the weight. That's the weight of the water in this imaginary uh, block of water acting down on this surface A. Okay. Now pressure is defined as force exerted over an area. So it's force over area. So the units of pressure are Newtons per meter squared. Now, uh, we give that a Newton per meter squared, uh, we call that a derived unit, and it's called a Pascal. So one Newton per meter squared is equal to one Pascal, and we abbreviate Pascals by capital PA. So those are the units of pressure in this uh, SI system's Pascals. So if we want to find the pressure at this point, we're going to find the force acting down on that point and divide it by the area that that force is acting on. So we take the weight of the liquid, so the weight of the fluid, in this case the liquid, and we divide it by the area. And you see what happens is the area cancels out. And as a result, we get the pressure, let's say capital P is pressure, in a liquid is equal to the density of the liquid times the acceleration due to gravity 
times H, which is the depth in the liquid. So that's the pressure due to a liquid. Okay? Uh, you could even say it's the pressure due to any fluid, I guess I should say. Pressure due to a fluid. It could be gas or liquid. So if you would jump into water, the pressure exerted by the water at the surface is zero because H is equal to zero. As you swim down deeper, the pressure that the water is exerting on you increases as H increases. Right? If you double your depth, you double the pressure that the water exerts on you. If you, if you increase your depth by a factor of 10, the pressure that water exerts on you uh, increases by a factor of 10. Now, in a fluid, it's important that the pressure at a point is equal in all directions. So, because the fluid pushes in all directions. So, it's not just pressure is downward. Pressure is in all directions. It's in this direction, in this direction, in this direction. It's equal in all directions. Uh, and we call this pressure that's exerted equally in all directions in a fluid that's not moving, a static fluid, we call that hydrostatic pressure. So this is hydrostatic pressure of a fluid. So this is the pressure in a fluid that's not moving. Right, like if you jumped in a swimming pool. The deeper in the swimming pool you go, the larger H gets, the larger the pressure. That's why you get a certain depth and your ears pop. Right, because the pressure increases and um, your, the pressure has to equil equilibrate inside your inner ear. All right, now we all experience pressure. We're all experiencing pressure right now. And that's the pressure due to the weight of the fluid we live in. What fluid do we live in? We, we live in the atmosphere. Right, and so the atmosphere is a gas. It has a mass. Earth's gravity pulls it down. And so the weight of the atmosphere acting down on our surface area creates pressure. And we call that pressure atmospheric pressure. So atmospheric pressure is the pressure exerted by the atmosphere. And it could be kind of related to this, where as you go, as you go further up into the atmosphere, the pressure decreases because you're not as deep in the atmosphere. But this equation does not hold true for the atmosphere because this equation assumes that the fluid has a constant density, uh, like water. Uh, liquids are incompressible, so you can't compress liquids. Gases are compressible. So gases, if you add pressure to them, they can become more dense. If you decrease the pressure on them, they become less dense. Liquids, it doesn't matter what the pressure is, they have the same density. So. Water, no matter how deep you go in water, it has the same density. That's not true for gases. The atmosphere's density decreases as you go to higher uh, altitudes. So, uh, this equation does not hold true for the atmosphere because the density is not constant. But in general, the higher you go in the atmosphere, the less gas is overhead pushing down on you so the lower the pressure. So atmospheric pressure is largest at sea level, and it does, and it decreases with height above sea level. So why pressure is so much lower. Um, so pressure is so much lower uh, at high altitudes. So for example, if you're a sports fan, in particular, if you follow the NFL, you'll know that um, the Denver Broncos have a a little bit of a special home field advantage because they practice and play uh, at, in the Rocky Mountains, which is high altitude. And so the pressure, the atmospheric pressure, is lower there than, say, Miami, Florida, which is right at sea level. And also, not only is the pressure lower, but the density of air is lower. Because less pressure means the air can expand, it's less dense. And if it's less dense, that means there's less atoms or molecules of air per unit volume. And the molecule of air that you need, uh, especially to live, but you need a lot of it if you're exercising, is oxygen. And so at higher altitudes, not only is pressure lower, 
but the density of air is lower too, so there's less oxygen per unit of volume. So you could be exerting yourself and breathing and feel like, oh man, it just feels like I can't catch my breath like I normally can. Well, it's because you can't because with each breath, there's actually less oxygen molecules per breath than you're used to if you're used to exercising at atmosphere, at, at sea level where atmospheric pressure and the density of the atmosphere is higher. That's why some athletes will train in hypobaric chambers. Hypo meaning lower and baric means pressure. They train in lower pressure, lower pressure chambers so their body gets used to operating with less oxygen molecules per breath. Um, and just a little side note, how your body compensates for that is by producing more red blood cells. Because the red blood cells is what transports the oxygen uh, throughout your body. Uh, and so if you go, if you live at a higher altitude, you eventually acclimate to it. And the way your body acclimates to it is by producing more red blood cells. So, um, so in the atmosphere, as you go higher, higher altitude, not only the pressure decreases, atmospheric pressure decreases, but so does the uh, density because it's a gas, right? And if lower pressure means it's able to expand and it has a lower density. So at sea level, atmospheric pressure, okay? We call it P A T M. So one. Oh, sorry, PATM, atmospheric pressure. We actually have a unit that we say it's one ATM, one atmosphere of pressure. Now, one atmosphere of pressure is uh, it's one one hundred one thousand three hundred twenty five pascals. Okay, or one point zero one three times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 pascals. That is atmospheric pressure. So that is the pressure that the atmosphere exerts at sea level. Now this is at sea level. So the question is, is uh, say if you jump in a swimming pool, how deep would you have to swim in that swimming pool uh, so that the pressure you experience is twice atmospheric pressure. So 1 ATM is equal to 1.013 times 10 to the fifth pascals. So let's say you have a swimming pool of water. The pressure at the surface. What is the pressure at the surface? Well, it's 1 atm. It's atmospheric pressure. That's the pressure that you experience laying uh, on the chase, you know, laying on the uh, bench at poolside. You feel atmospheric pressure. And what depth down here, pH, is the pressure equal to 2 atm? Well, the pressure down here is going to be the pressure at the surface plus the pressure due to the water. So the pressure down here, um, H is equal to 1 atm plus the density of water plus the exertion of gravity plus H. Okay? And we want to find at what depth is the pressure at this depth equal to 2 atm? So 2 atm equals pressure at the surface. Oh, I should write this as P surface. That's a D. So the pressure at the surface is 1 atmosphere plus the density of water, GH. Track that. You get uh, 1. A T M equals density of water G H. Now I'm going to round. Okay, so if the density of water is a thousand kilograms per cubic meter, 
I'm going to round the acceleration due to gravity to, uh, to roughly 10. 10 uh, meters per second squared. Okay? And one atmosphere, remember that is 1.01 times 10 to the fifth pascals. So to find h, h is equal to 1 times 0 and 3 times 10 to the fifth pascals divided by 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter times 10 meters per second squared. So that's uh, 1,000 times 10, that's 10,000, or 1 times 10 to the fourth. You divide this by 1 times 10 to the fourth, and you get approximately 10 meters. So it's really close to 10 meters, right? So you've got to go a depth of 10 meters so that to, 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 for the water to exert pressure that's equal to one atmosphere on you, so that the total pressure is two atmospheres. So, in other words, as you jump in water and you swim down, uh, for every 10 meters you swim down, the pressure increases by one atmosphere, or 1.013 times 10 to the fifth pascals, which is one atmosphere. So at a depth of 20 meters, the pressure is three atmospheres. One atmosphere from the air, and then two additional atmospheres for being not 10, but 20 meters below the surface. Mm -hmm. So for every 10 meters below the surface of water, the pressure increases by one atmosphere. So if you're 30 meters beneath the surface, the water is exerting a pressure of three atmospheres, then the actual uh, atmosphere itself is exerting a pressure of one atmosphere, so it's a total pressure of of four atmospheres. So if we have a pressure gauge on some instrumentation or equipment, it usually reads zero if there's no pressure in the fluid that it's trying to measure. Uh, and that pressure gauge is reading zero, where the pressure usually isn't zero unless it's a vacuum. Uh, we call that gauge pressure. So pressure gauges are usually calibrated that zero pressure is one atmosphere. And so, the pressure at the surface here, the gauge pressure, is equal to zero. But the absolute pressure is one atmosphere, right? Where at a depth of 10 meters, the, what we call a gauge pressure is equal to one atmosphere. But the absolute pressure is two atmospheres. Because uh, you know it's kind of redundant if all our pressure gauges always like just read one atmosphere, right? Well, let's assume, right? Because we live in the atmosphere, so they calibrate pressure gauges that zero is one atmosphere of pressure. It's almost like you know if you go to the uh, deli or something, you, they put your food, your coleslaw or something in the container, and they put it on the scale to measure how much it is to charge you. Well, you don't want to pay for the container, right? And so they tear, or they zero out the scale with the container on it. And so they recalibrate the scale, so zero pounds is, is with the container on it. So that's what pressure gauges do. They're zero at one atmosphere of pressure. Um, and so gauge pressure just reads the pressure of other fluids, uh, where absolute pressure is the pressure of any other fluids plus atmosphere. All right, so that is pressure. And importantly, this is, that's pressure in a static fluid. That means a fluid that's not moving. If the fluid's moving, then that has implications for the pressure, which we'll talk about later. So now we're going to get to the buoyant force. Okay, so everyone knows if you throw something in water, that object will either sink or float. It'll do one of the two, right? And uh, even if it does sink, as it descends, it accelerates to the bottom of the water 
but not at the same rate as if it would free fall. So the fact that the object can float or accelerate downwards at a rate that's smaller than that due to gravity suggests that whenever an object is in water, there's an upward force on it that's counteracting either all of its weight or some of its weight. And that is the buoyant force. So the buoyant force is the force a fluid exerts, sorry, it's an upward force. Upward force a fluid exerts on an object that is submerged in it. It's a fluid, not just a liquid. So, well, the atmosphere, the gas, the fluid, does it exert a buoyant force? Yes, it does. How do you think hot air balloons fly, right? They fly because they're buoyant. What about helium balloons? How do they rise? Buoyancy. Um, but uh, you have to be, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but it's much more obvious in liquids, right? Especially water, right? If you, Put something in water, and it'll sink or float because there's an upward force on it. If you submerge an object in water, the fluid exerts an upward force on it. That is called the buoyant force. Okay. Now, what is the strength of that buoyant force? How strong is the buoyant force? Well, that's Archimedes' principle. He's the one that figured out how strong the buoyant force is. Okay? Now, we can see we could, we could conceptually uh, figure out how strong the buoyant force is. Let's say we have a fluid. Okay? Let's say it's a liquid. And we have an object. And it's submerged in the fluid. The object has a height h. That's how high the object is. And this is a, it's a rectangle, and it, its bottom has an area of h, and this is an area, sorry, an area of a, and the top is an area of a. Now, let's, uh, let's do this differently. Let's say this has a height D. No, 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 we can do that. I'm sorry. H. And it's submerged a depth D. Now, we say that the a fluid exerts a pressure in all directions. So the, the, let's say if this is water, water is exerting a pressure downward on it here. It's exerting a pressure upward on it here. Right? But the pressure that the fluid exerts on the object up here is less than the pressure that the fluid exerts upward on it down here. Why? Well, because the pressure here, the gauge pressure, the pressure due to the water, let's call this the top, is equal to the density of water. So let's just say the density of the fluid. It could be anything. Density of the liquid. The density times G times D, right? Because it's this depth. The pressure here at the bottom is equal to D times G, but it's not at a depth D, it's at a depth D plus H. Okay? So the pressure is greater here. Just like if you go down deeper in a, in a liquid, the pressure increases. So the pressure upward is greater than the pressure downward. On the sides, 
Well, the pressure here is equal to the pressure here, because it's the same depth. And the pressure here is equal to the pressure here, it's the same depth. And it's important to know, I failed to mention that a fluid, the pressure is always exerted perpendicular to the surface. So the pressure is always perpendicular to the surface. Okay? And so on the sides, the pressures are all equal at the same depths all the way around. So it's pushing equally at this depth, it's pushing pressure is equal in all directions in you know, this depth and so forth. But the pressures are different at the top and the bottom. Now the force, remember, pressure is force over area. So the force exerted by a pressure is equal, oh, the force exerted by pressure is equal to the pressure times the area that the pressure is acting on. So here, the force that the fluid is exerting down at the top is equal to the pressure times the area it's acting on. And here, the force exerting on the bottom, so we could call this force bottom force top is equal to the pressure times the area the pressure is acting on. Now if we say this is the positive y direction, let's find the net force exerted on the object by the fluid. Well, that's going to be, well, the force on the bottom, so the pressure is acting upward on the bottom in this area. The force due to at the bottom due to that pressure is up. So I'm going to say D and G is D plus H A. That's the force upward. Right? That's the pressure at the bottom times the area that that pressure is acting on. Minus the force downward, which is the pressure at the top times the area it's acting on. So that's D G D, that depth B times A. Now if I distribute these terms, and we come over here, I get D, G, D, A uh, times D, G, H, A minus D, G, Those cancel out. So the force due to the pressure imbalance on the top and the bottom of the liquid is equal to D G H A, where H times A is the volume of the object. And it's positive, right? It's upward. So the resulting force upward is equal to the density of the fluid, of the liquid, times the volume of the object times gravity. Now, the density of the liquid times the volume of the object times gravity, That what is that? That's the mass of the uh, volume of fluid displaced by the object. Because okay, this volume is the volume of the object. Here, all right, all right, object and submerged. And this is the density of the fluid. So if you take the density of the fluid and multiply it by the volume of the object, you get the mass of the volume of the fluid that's displaced by the object submerged in the fluid. 
And if you take the mass of the volume of fluid displaced by the object and multiply it by gravity, you get the weight of the volume of fluid that's displaced by the object. And so that upward force that the fluid exerts on an object it's equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. Okay, so the more fluid the object displaces, the greater the upward buoyant force. Let's think of a boat, right? And so that's Archimedes' principle, that the buoyant force, now we call this Fb, buoyant force is equal to the density of the fluid times the volume of the object that's submerged in the fluid, times acceleration through gravity. In other words, the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the volume of fluid that's displaced by the object. And like I said, a, like a boat. Right? A boat floats in water. So the boat has a weight, mg, and it's floating, so it's not accelerating, so it has a buoyant force, fb, they're equal and opposite. So if you take this volume, this is the volume of the fluid that's being displaced by the boat. And so it's this submerged volume equals density of the fluid times the volume of the object that's submerged times g. So the heavier the boat, the deeper it has to sink into the water. It has to submerge or displace a larger volume of water to generate the larger buoyant force. Let's say if you step into the boat. Now, it's the boat, what does the boat do? You step into the boat, it sinks lower. Why does it sink lower? It has to displace more volume of the fluid to generate a larger buoyant force to counteract now not only the weight of the boat, but the weight of your body. You step out of the boat, the boat floats up a little bit. Why? Because now it doesn't need as large of a buoyant force. It only needs a buoyant force large enough to counteract the weight of the boat, no longer the weight of the boat and your body, so it doesn't have to displace as much liquid. Okay? So, does it sink or does it float, an object? So let's say an object has a density OBJ, and it's in a fluid that has a density uh, fluid. So here's that object, okay, and it has a volume V O B J. That's the volume of the object. Now the, the, the weight of the object acts down, which is M G, and the buoyant force acts up. In order for it to float, the buoyant force has to be greater than or equal to the weight, correct? Because if the buoyant force is equal to the weight, it just kind of rests there, it's in equilibrium, it doesn't sink or float, it, it floats doesn't rise or doesn't sink. If the buoyant force is greater than the weight, there's going to be a net force upward, and it's going to rise to the surface. Right? It's going to float. So in order for it to float, the buoyant force has to be greater than or equal to the weight of the object. Now, the buoyant force is equal to the density of the fluid multiplied by the um, submerged volume of the object times g. So it's the weight of the submerged volume of the object. It has to be greater than or equal to the weight of the object. So the weight of the object is equal to the density of the object times the volume of the object, the entire volume of the object. Right? Because remember, density times volume is going to give us mass, right? It's mass. So this is the mass of the displaced volume of the fluid times g. It's the weight of the displaced volume of the fluid. And this is the mass of the object times g, and the weight of the object. Okay? So, uh, 
those cancel out, and you see the density of the, uh, so, uh, if we divide this over there, and divide this over here, we get the submerged volume of the object divided by the volume of the object, greater than or equal to um, the density of the object and the density of the fluid. Okay? And let's say it's 100% submerged, right? That's the most we can have submerged, is 100%. So if the submerged volume of the object is the entire volume of the object, this becomes 1. So I guess, let me rewrite it this way. If the entire object is submerged, then these cancel out too. We see the object floats, right? The object floats if the void force is greater than or equal to the weight of the object floats if the density of the fluid is greater than or equal to the density of the object. Okay? In other words, the object will float as long as its density is less than or equal to the density of the fluid. So a piece of wood floats in water. Therefore, the density of wood, the object, is less than or equal to the density of water. It has to be in order for it to float. Newton's second law tells us that in order for it to float, the buoyant force has to be greater than or equal to the weight of the object. And we derive that in order for that to be the case, the density of the fluid has to be greater than or equal to the density of the object. So lead sinks in water. Why? Because the density of lead is in fact greater than the density of water, so it sinks. Now if you change the fluid, say if it's a really dense fluid, like mercury, right? If you put a pool of mercury, it's really dense. It's hard to find an object that's actually denser than mercury. So most objects will float in mercury. In fact, if you have a solid piece of steel, we think of steel metal as being dense, right? It is dense, but it's not as dense as mercury. So steel actually floats in liquid mercury because mercury is so dense. Uh, on YouTube, uh, you can actually find videos I'll post them on Blackboard of, of, a, of, of metal objects floating in a pool of mercury. Because this is true. The density of the fluid mercury is greater than the density of metal. So it'll float. So that's Archimedes' principle. An object will float as long as the density of the fluid is greater than the density of the object. Now, one last thing in Archimedes' principle. Never hear the saying, oh, that's just the tip of the iceberg. I'm sure you have. And uh, that saying kind of implies that uh, there's more than what you can see. Like, that's just a small amount. There's much more uh, behind it that you can't see. Well, in, in the ocean, there's the water. In the iceberg, you see there's just a small portion of the iceberg that's above water. But most of the iceberg is below water. And so just the tip of the iceberg infers that that's just a small piece of it. So at the iceberg, the weight is the volume of the iceberg. Sorry, it's the density of ice density of ice times the volume of ice of the ice times g. That's its weight. The buoyant force is the density of water times the volume of ice that's submerged times g. Okay. And when it's floating, we know that the buoyant force 
So the density of water times the volume, oh, that's a script B, times the submerged volume of the ice, times G equals the density of ice, times the volume of ice, times G. Okay? So we have the density, we rearrange density of water divided by the density of ice. Oh, no, let me do it the other way. The volume of ice that's submerged divided by the volume of ice is equal to the density of ice and the density of water. And so because we know the density of ice is less than the density of water, uh, this number is less than 1. And because this number is less than 1, that means that the volume of the ice that's submerged must be less than the um, volume of the, of the ice itself. And if I just look up quickly, um, I think uh, let's just I think it's about 900 kilograms per meter cube. Let's say the, the density of ice is 900 kilograms per meter cubed, approximately. And we get 900 kilograms per meter cubed, followed by 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. This gives us 0 0.9. So we have the volume of the ice that's submerged is equal to 90% approximately of the volume of the ice. So that means this submerged volume is approximately 90% of the entire volume. So just the tip of the iceberg is this, which is 100 minus 90, so about 10%. So when everyone says, oh, that's just the tip of the iceberg, they're saying that's about, just about 10% of it, right? Because an iceberg, Approximately 10% is above the water, 90% is below the water. All right, that's Archimedes' principle. And finally, that brings us to Bernoulli's principle. Right. So if we have, say, a liquid. Uh, that's flowing through this tube, and this tube narrows. And we have pressure gauges. Um, what happens is, let's say it's a liquid like water, water is incompressible, so it can't, it can't become dense or less dense. And if water is flowing through it, the rate, the rate of mass that has to move through this pipe has to remain constant. And so, because this has a larger cross-sectional area, the water doesn't have to flow as fast, but because this is a smaller cross-sectional area, 82, in order for the same amount of water to move through a, for past a particular point in the same amount of time, um, say if it has a velocity v1 here, it has to develop a larger velocity v2. It has to flow faster. Now, you've probably all experienced this, uh, like if you ever played with a garden hose, Right, water's pouring out of the garden hose. If you put your thumb over part of the opening, what happens is the water begins to squirt out faster and further. Well, why is that? Because the same amount of water has to come out per unit time, because water cannot be compressed. And if you use your thumb to close off some of the opening, that means that the water has to move faster out that opening for the same amount of water to be coming out in a given amount of time. And so if you narrow the, the, the pipe, the water has to speed up to flow through. Okay? Uh, then once it gets here, the water slows back down. Now, how does the water speed up? It doesn't change height, right? So there's no change in gravitational potential energy. But water it has liquids that have, they have mass, so uh, they have to, there's a change in energy here, right? If it has a, a velocity v1 and then it has a larger velocity v2, it increased in kinetic energy. 
In order to have an increase in kinetic energy, there has to be a net force acting through a distance, doing work on the object, positive work on the object, or in this case, on the liquid, um, giving it additional energy. And so there has to be a net force in this direction. And what generates force in fluids? Pressure. So the, this is A1. So this is P1 acts on A1. This is A2. P2 acts on A2. Right? And so there has to be, due to this pressure, and this pressure, there has to, so if this force over here is P1 times A1. And this force over here, let's say this is in the positive x direction, this force acting this way is P2 times A2. We know that uh, this has to be uh, greater than zero, right? It has to be a net force in that direction. So P1, A1 has to be greater than P2, A2. Uh, where A2 is this area, cross-section area, A1 is that cross-section area. So then if we divide P1 over P2, it's greater than A2 over A1. area, so uh, this, since this is a larger area to generate a uh, larger force, we have a given pressure, and the pressure is smaller over here, uh, so that we have a smaller net force. So we have to have a net force that's in that direction to give it energy, and so because there has to be a net force, the pressure over here has to be larger than the pressure over here. So if this is zero pressure, the gauge pressure here, P1, is going to be larger than the gauge pressure over here, P2. P2 is going to be less than P1. Because there has to be a, uh, oh, you know what the problem is? I'm comparing these two areas that are far apart. If you shrink it so that the areas are approximately the same over a very short, very short distance, those areas are approximately the same, they cancel out. So over a very short distance, it has to just speed up a little bit over a short distance. And in order to do so, P2, P1 has to be greater than P2. So as a fluid, its velocity increases, the pressure in that fluid decreases. Back over here, the pressure will increase. This is the same area, A1, and go back to P1. Uh, and this is Bernoulli's principle, that as the velocity of a fluid increases, the pressure in that fluid decreases. Now this is the dynamic pressure. This isn't hydrostatic pressure. Remember, hydrostatic pressure, rho g, uh, the density times g times the depth. That's for a fluid that's not moving. This is a fluid that's moving. This is how an airplane works. You have a wing, right? This is the cross section of a wing, right? It comes out into the board. And as it moves through the air, air travels over the wing and under the wing. The air that travels over the wing, due to the shape of the wing, has to travel a slightly further distance than the air under the wing. And they come again, they travel that distance, those, those two different distances, in the same amount of time. And so in order to do so, the velocity of the air at the bottom the velocity of the air at the bottom is just slightly larger than the uh, sorry, slightly less than the velocity of the air above the wing. Because the, the air has to travel a slightly further distance above the wing than below the wing. So it has to be traveling faster to cover that little larger distance at the same amount of time. And because the velocity below the wing is lower, right? The lower the velocity, the higher the pressure. The higher the velocity, the lower the pressure. The pressure in the bottom 
is greater than the pressure at the top. So pressure bottom, pressure top. Uh, pressure in the bottom is a little bit larger. And because they have approximately the same area, pressure times area is force. That means the force acting on the bottom is larger than the force acting down the top, slightly larger. So there's a net force upward, and that's lift. And that's how airplanes fly. They fly because of the way the wing is designed, that the air has to travel a little bit further distance over the top and below. So the air has to travel a little bit faster. Because the, over the top, because the air is traveling a little bit faster over the top, the pressure above the wing is a little bit lower than the pressure below the wing. And as a result, the net force up on the wing uh, is, there's a net force up on the wing due to the higher pressure below the wing. And that's what we call lift. So Bernoulli's principle in general is the larger the velocity in a fluid, the lower the pressure. The lower the velocity in the fluid, the greater the pressure. And if you ever drive on the highway and a tractor trailer comes right up a pass and you feel like you get pulled in, like your car gets pulled in towards that tractor trailer, that's, that's not your imagination, that's physics. Right? Because as the tractor trailer is moving past you, the speed of the air between your car and the tractor trailer is now faster than the speed of the air on the other side of your car. And because the air is flowing faster uh, between your car and the tractor trailer, the air pressure is slightly lower on that side than the other side. Because the pressure is a little bit larger over here, and the areas of your car are the same on both sides, that creates a, net, a small net force toward the tractor trailer. That's why it feels like you get pulled toward the tractor trailer. Or if there's a pickup truck and there's a tarp on the bed, the tarp always seems to be lifting up. Why does the tarp always seem to be lifting up? Because the air is flowing over the top, or the tarp has a high velocity, but the air underneath the tarp is barely moving. So that means the pressure is much larger below the tarp than above the tarp. And that difference in pressure creates a net force. Because remember, force is pressure times area. The tarp has the same area on the bottom as it does the top. So this larger pressure exerting on this area generates a larger force upward. And this smaller pressure exerting down on that same area creates a smaller force. There's a net force up. So that's why the tarp always seems to be and pulled up. So you're wondering, like, why? I think the air would be pushing it down. Well, no. Bernoulli's principle means there's a lower pressure above the tarp and below the tarp. That's why it gets pushed up. It's also how high wind speeds can lift roofs off the top of structures and can blow out windows. If the wind speed is is sufficiently large enough outside the house that can create a low enough pressure outside the house that the inside the house where the speed is very small results in a larger pressure inside than outside. And that larger pressure, I anytime mean, there's a pressure difference across an area that creates a net force, that's a net force. And that can lift, push, push the roof off because the it's not that the pressure was increased inside the house, it's just the pressure is so low outside. And then you have this pressure difference, which creates a net force, lift it off or blow out the windows, uh, potentially. Like the wind has to be going really fast for the pressure to drop low enough for the pressure difference to be large enough to create a net force strong enough to lift that roof or, um, or uh, blow out the windows. So now the building codes, when you put on the, the uh, the joists on the roof, you have to use these hurricane ties, which are these metal ties. So this is the roof. It attaches it to that so it can't be lifted off. So this concludes our